All right, the second major example of the B.O. Savara law that you're likely to see and be responsible for is a segment of wire. Not only is this a great problem to do because it gives you chance to practice the B.O. Savara law, uh, it, it reinforces the partition summation ideas, it gives you a chance to uh, revisit the trig sub integration technique, but at the end, we look at the final solution and see that we can extend it a bit, literally seeing what happened when the segment of wire becomes an infinite long wire. And that will give us a nice transition piece to Ampere's law, which gets the same solution in a much simpler way. So there are four major parts to this, the setup and geometry of the situation. We'll set up and use the Biosavar law. We will see that it's hard to make any progress with an X and Y looking geometry because of the weirdness of the integral. And then we'll get the final solution by doing a trig sub. So we have a segment of wire carrying current in the positive X direction. We have a point somewhere above or below the wire. It doesn't really matter which. I just put it above because I felt like it'd be easier to draw. And I also deliberately put the point P off center so that we can have a solution that's a little bit more generic than just choosing some symmetry axis. And this will help extend the concept when we make the wire infinitely long, because then this thing will have to be in the middle of an infinitely long wire. We have X direction, Y direction, Z direction. As you'll see in a moment, because our partition is going to be some little piece of this wire, X will be a thing that changes because the partition will move from the left to the right as we integrate. However, the Y direction, the distance from point P to each one of these current elements is not any different in the Y direction. The only thing that changes is the X distance. So while both X and R will change, Y will not. That means that for all the setup and all the expressions, we can think of y as being a constant like any of the other constants. Okay, so this is our r vector that points from the current element partition to our point of interest p. We'll draw that later just because it's important to look at some of the angles and the relationships with x and y. But all I'm doing now is showing you what the cross product will do. Take a moment to think about it you'll see that R has a component that points perpendicular to IDS, and it has a component that points parallel to IDS. The component that points perpendicular is the only one that's going to matter. The other part points parallel to DS, so it's not going to do anything in the cross product. It's going to be zero. So that leaves us in a right-hand rule kind of way of thinking about it with an IDS vector that points to the right, a component of R, the only component that matters, that points up, and that's going to give us a field at point P. If you take a moment and just reflect on it, you'll see how this is just showing us something we already know, which is that the magnetic field curls around us a wire. So at that point P, that curling, loopy magnetic field points straight out of the page. So it's going to be a B in the Z direction. So we have our vector that points in this direction. We have a right triangle. We can call this Y and we can call this X, both distances. We can call this angle phi. We can call this angle theta. The reason that I'm using phi is to show you that when you do the cross product, you're taking your first vector IDS and you are crossing it into the second vector R. And so what you want is the angle between those two things. That means that we want the sine of phi. So when I rewrite the BIOS of our law, we're left with the constants as they always were. We have the current element IDS, but now we've indicated that it points along the X direction, so I'm going to call it DX. We have a sine phi that comes from the cross product itself. I'm going to rewrite that in terms of these quantities. 
And we've got the familiar one over R squared. Here you see I've rewritten it slightly because phi and theta are complementary angles. I can kind of swap one for the other and I can rewrite it as cosine theta. I think most of you will see the benefit of that later on uh, because it'll be easier to visualize what happens to theta. <clears throat> um, so we have r squared equals x squared plus y squared, as usual Pythagorean theorem. We have cosine theta equals adjacent over hypotenuse. And because it'll turn out to be useful later, we have tan theta equals opposite over adjacent x over y. A slight rewrite of this gives us x equals y tan theta. So if I replace cosine theta with y over r, then it's tempting to say that we've got something that looks kind of clean. We end up with db z component only equals mu naught i over 4 pi times dx over r squared times y over r. And that gives us mu naught i dx times y over 4 pi times x squared plus y squared to the 3 halves. Uh, you'll recall that I just did a substitution here from this guy right there. However, if you take a moment and inspect this integral, because you know the next step, of course, is to do a summation, if we look at the integral that this would produce, we have dx and we have x, so that looks clean. Mu naught i and 4 pi are all constants as far as uh, this integral goes. And in fact, y is also a constant as far as this integral goes because each one of these current elements is the same y distance from our point p. However, as you've learned in your calculus class, if you're going to do an integral over dx, and if you've got x squared raised to some power, then that means you're sort of searching around for a udu which means you'd really like to see something like a 2x or an x up in the numerator, and you don't have it. That means that in its current form, this integral is not an easy one to do. In fact, it's impossible to do by most of the techniques that you learn in integral calculus. Uh, you may consult a table of integrals to find the particular solution, uh, but it ends up being kind of a messy thing. If you do consult a table of integrals, you get an answer to this in terms of x and y, but I don't think it's particularly helpful in terms of understanding the concepts. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to not look at it this way and instead go back up to this step and do some trigonometric substitutions so that instead of in expressing this in terms of dx, theta, and r squared, we express it purely in terms of theta and d theta. The first thing that becomes obvious is that in order to express this thing as an integral over theta, you're going to need a d theta, which means you somehow have to replace dx with something from this list of trigonometric identities. The easiest one is, of course, this one right here, because y is a constant as far as this integral is concerned, and tan theta has a very well-known derivative. So this becomes dx equals y times sec squared theta d theta. And that's going to turn out to be a really useful thing for us to take advantage of. R squared, instead of using a Pythagorean theorem substitution like I used down here, will instead be replaced using y and theta in this expression which I messed up the first time, but you can see that if you uh, multiply both sides by r and then divide by cosine theta, you get r equals y sec theta. So once I rewrite the bios of our law using these substitutions, mu naught i over 4 pi remains. dx now gets replaced with y sec squared theta d theta. 1 over r squared gets replaced with 1 over y squared sec squared theta, 
and cosine theta remains exactly where it was. You all know what's coming, so prepare yourselves. Since I went to all the trouble of making this video, I expect you while you're listening and watching to make the noise. What remains? is a very simple expression. Now we have the final expression of the partition, the one current element that we used as an example. The next step is to find the total field by integration. So when I write the integral, you see that all of these terms come out, even the y, because again, y is a constant. This vertical distance is the same for all of the segments of the wire. And all that's left to do is to figure out the upper and lower limits of integration. If I kind of quickly re-sketch this segment of wire, we have point P up here, then we can simply call this thing theta one and call that thing theta two. Because theta one sort of opens clockwise from our current elements and theta two opens counterclockwise, I'm gonna call theta one negative, theta two positive. And that's our answer. As I mentioned in the beginning of the video, it is interesting to think about what happens to this expression if you extend the wire to negative infinity and infinity and see how this expression changes and see if it gives us any insights about the nature of this field. So if you take a moment to look at this diagram, you can see that theta one and theta two both sort of tend towards 90 degrees as the wire tends towards an infinite length. Of course, I'm going to have to be careful how I speak here because unlike the gravitational, electric, and magnetic force, the force powers of Mrs. Kansari do not drop off with distance. She always knows. As theta one and theta two tend towards 90 degrees, then both of those expressions tend toward just one and one. So we end up with mu naught i over two pi y. Now, there are several benefits to this expression here. And remember, this is a special case. One benefit is that you can see this expression has one over r behavior and not one over r squared. That kind of seems to run counterintuitively to all the distance matters kind of stuff that I've been talking about. But remember, what you've essentially done is you've created an infinite number of current elements. So if you've made the number of them extend towards infinity in one direction, then that means that you've got an infinite number of one over r squared components. And those two infinities sort of tend to become just a one over r. The second thing is that you can see the only thing that matters in terms of the field strength, as you would expect, are the strength of the current and the distance from the wire. As the strength of the current increases, the numerator increases and the field gets stronger. As you get farther away from the wire, denominator increases field gets weaker. The last thing that's interesting about this is that this expression will be something we can get very, very quickly using Ampere's law, where we don't have to worry about any of this nasty trig stuff. We don't really have to even do a very hard integration. Just like Gauss's theorem, Ampere's law will allow us to take advantage of the symmetry of the situation and come up with a solution much more quickly.